Hello there, I'm Black Bright, and if it's the first time you're coming to my channel, welcome. Um, if you want to subscribe, if you like my videos, please do and share if you think it can help someone else. Um, somebody sent me an email and they said to me, Black Bright, what is your typical day like? And I thought to myself, well, each one of my days is so different. So I decided to talk about my day yesterday which was when I went to the emergency department at the local hospital. And how that came about um, is that I was in a car accident and I didn't think there was anything wrong, to be honest. You know, you just get a jolt and, you know, you just go about your merry way. And yes, you'll feel a bit shocked and nervous and you might have a few aches and pains, but you don't really think of it as being anything serious anyway. Um, the day before, I'd gone to see my sisters, and um, one of them said to me, I told them about the accident, and one of them said to me, have you seen your GP? And I said, no. I said, I've only got some aches and pains. There's nothing really wrong. They said, well, supposing something happens later on down the line, you won't be able to do anything. And I thought, wow, that is a point. So I decided to go... Um, because my GP wasn't open, I decided to go to the A&E. And I, you know, my the hospital isn't too far from where I live, so I found a parking space and I thought um, that bank holiday would be a good day because, you know, you've got free parking, you don't have to worry about paying. And I thought that um, I could just walk it would be about five ten minute walk to the hospital but that's what I decided to do when I went to the A&E you go to there's three booths and you go to the you go to a streaming booth and that's where you tell them what's wrong and then they'll decide whether or not you, it's an emergency I guess but what was strange is that when I went to the emergency nobody really looked like an emergency situation and I guess I didn't either you know somebody looking at me they probably think what's she doing here in an emergency but for me it was important it was an emergency for me in the sense that you know when you report these things they're time bound and if you don't do it within a certain period it can kind of jeopardize any claims you may make you may wish to make so for me, I thought to myself, well, if I have to wait to go to my GP, it means I'm going to have to get to my GP an hour early, sit outside on the floor until it opens, because that is what's happened with my GP. And I think that is why there's so many people at the emergency, because with my GP, you have to go on the day. You They don't make you any appointments anymore so people go there and even if you get there it opens at 8 30 and even if you get there at 20 to 8 there's people already queuing you've got people sitting on the floor waiting for the gates to open so you can see a gp by the time it's opened at 8 30 the line is all outside to the car park and those people in the car park might not even get an appointment because those who have been there since 20 to 7 like me, will be the first come, first served. And then those people have to come again the next day in order to see if they can get an appointment. And maybe the next day they might come a bit earlier so they're not turned away. Anyway, so that's the reason why I went to the A&E. I couldn't put myself through getting up extra early, sitting, not sure how many people would be before me and waiting to see the GP. Anyway, when I got to the A&E, they took some details and they told me to go and see the emergency GP, which was in the same building, not too far from the A&E reception. When I went to the A&E, when I went to the emergency GP, they asked me for a um, asked me for twenty one pound fifty because it was a road traffic accident. I hadn't said I was going to claim or anything. They said that they said that's the protocol, and they gave me a statement that said Road Traffic Act that I was going to that that was my first GP that I'd seen, and some other things it said on it, and it had their stamp on it, um, my name, my vehicle number, and all of that. And then they told me to take a seat, and as 
type of person I am, I sat around and I looked at all the people in that emergency GP room. Unlike me, 90% of them didn't look like an emergency. Even before they streamed me and sent me to the emergency GP, the people that were in, in the emergency waiting to be seen didn't look like emergencies. I mean, back in the day, emergency, you'd see people with blood coming out, blood and guts, legs split open, all that kind of stuff. But it appears that now, if you can't see your GP, people go to the emergency because what they cannot you know, everybody's aches and pains or whatever's wrong with them is an emergency to them. It's not an emergency to the to the department, but for them, it's an emergency or it's important or whatever. Anyway, I as I normally do, I scan the room and I could hear this. Uh, uh, and it was incessant. And I'm thinking, where is that noise coming from? I couldn't see where it was coming from. Anyway, as I normally do, I'm quite a observant person. I just decided to look around the room and try to imagine what was wrong with all the different people who looked as though there was nothing wrong with them. There was a woman with her five-year-old child and the child was laughing and she was playing with his hair and I'm like, she doesn't look as though there's anything wrong with her. He doesn't look as if there's anything wrong with him. Then I saw a man get up. He was kind of limping, but not to any large degree. And I thought, hmm, he doesn't look like an emergency. And that's what I was doing. I was in that emergency department looking at people who didn't look like they was in an emergency situation, just like me. People probably thought, what the hell is she doing here? The fact of the matter is, is that if I've got a blood clot in the back of my head, or if I've got something, um, if I've dislocated something and I'm not aware of it, because, you know, that would be an emergency for me, even though it wasn't visible. So what I learned from being in that emergency ward, in that emergency situation, was that not all emergencies are visible. A lot of those emergencies are mental, psychological, emotional to that individual and that is the difference so I sat next to a guy um, it was a big white guy and he said to, he said to me how long have you been waiting here and I said well probably about 20 minutes to half an hour he said okay I've just come after you then he said I probably won't wait too long and he was saying he'd been a plumber all his life and you know he's telling me about his mum who's 93 and she can't walk and she can't do this and you know um she's she's not eating and she's down to six stone and he's been he's been on his knees doing his plumbing and now his foot's hurting and so he needs to get it looked at and I was listening to his story, and as I was listening to his story, I realised where the noise was coming from. It was coming from a boy. He looked about 15 or 16, severely disabled, and he was jumping from one seat to another. And it was quite an intimidating behaviour he had. And he had something in his hand. I don't know what it was, but I don't know if it was made out of plastic, but I was just thinking, suppose when he jumped up and got into another seat, he hit someone with it. And that was what was going through my head. And then I was thinking, you know, you can't tell by age. You can't say that by a certain age you're going to be behave in a certain way or certain things are going to happen to you. Because there was this 15, 16 year old who was in obviously in some kind of pain. He was like a dog that got a, a, a thorn in his foot. That's what it reminded me of. And he was going kind of crazy. And I was thinking to myself, he's only 15, 16. And then, you know, I was looking at all the different ages in that, in that room. And you cannot say age because it's a you because your body deteriorates. Why something's gonna happen? Because there were people of all ages in there. And it made me kind of um, appreciate where I was there and then but also it made me realize that there's different kind of emergencies anyway um they got up 
they called my name. I thought, oh, that was quick, but that was just to take my temperature and my pulse. By the time I went back to my seat, it had gone. I had to bloody stand up and I didn't feel like standing up. Anyway, it wasn't too long before they called me in. He made me look straight ahead, put some lights in my eyes. He looked in my ear. He told me to put my hands out, told me to bend and touch my toes. And he said, you know, you're a bit stiff. You've got whiplash and um, I should take some painkillers and just rest for a couple of days. I didn't even know I had whiplash, to be honest. I didn't even know what whiplash was. I just, I thought whiplash was something that affected your whole back and you couldn't move. That's what I thought whiplash was. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't feel, still don't feel 100%. Um, but yeah, I didn't realise that that jolt, that sudden jolt could actually make you feel so weird. And yeah, and all I'm saying to people is that, you know, you don't take these things lightly. You know, if you are in a car accident and you do feel okay, don't minimise it like what I did. I'm a type of person, I go on cues. I'm, I listen for cues and I listen to what people say. So I tend to kind of pick up on what people say and I act on it, which is usually quite good for me. I never minimise it or knock it out of the park. I just usually act on it. And it was like, even though my um, sister said to me quite frivolously, not frivolously, but quite flippantly, oh, you should really go and get that checked out. I took that on board and I did realise that yesterday morning I didn't feel great. You know, I know that while I'm doing things, it can take um, the focus off of the way I'm feeling, but I didn't feel great and I still don't feel great. But the fact that I went to the hospital and my main, you know, my ability is okay and he said my retina is okay and according to his tests, which might seem superficial to me, they probably eliminated any kind of um, other damage. You know, I did feel a bit better coming home. And I thought, OK, that is the end of your day. But then, of course, I have my videos and I thought, you know what, let me do a video. And that's what I do. I kind of think to myself, have I got something to tell anybody? Have I got something that can benefit someone? And sometimes people send me stuff. Sometimes I look through the newspaper. Sometimes it's an inspiration I never force it though. It has to come naturally. I, it has to resonate with me. If somebody sends me something, I have to kind of feel it. If I feel it, then I'll kind of do some research on it and I'll look about three or four different sources and see if I can get any more information. And then I'll think to myself, how do I look? Do I, do I feel like doing a video? And I get in tune with my feelings. And then I look at myself at these cameras and I think, oh man, you look like crap. You better go and put on some makeup or you better do this or you better do that. And, you know, it's it's a, it's a, it's it's not a straightforward thing when you do these videos. You can't. Well, I can't just sit there and say, um, start chatting. There has to be some planning involved. And I even to do with. Yeah, sometimes I might not feel great and I might not think I look great. Another person might look at me because I'm quite self-critical. Another person might look at me and think, oh, yeah, you look great or you look good or you look OK. I, I, I really don't know. But as long as I feel OK and I look at myself and I have to tell myself, don't be too judgmental. When you're doing these videos, you can't be too self-critical. And I'm saying that for people who may want to do vlogging. Don't be too self-critical. Don't try to be perfect. Don't try to look perfect because there is nothing called perfection. And all you do is you just go with the flow. You go with the vibe, whatever resonates with you. It has to be natural. You need to be authentic. You need to have integrity. I don't force videos because if I force them, I... Um, I feel it and it doesn't work well and I just won't show it to anyone. But because somebody asked me, what was my day like? This is my typical day. I mean, of course, I, you know, I do the no normal things like have a shower, have a bath, have something to eat. You know, I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty, gritty things about that. 
Yesterday I, I fried some fish, if you want to know, I did some rice. But, you know, those kind of things, you know, I'm not going to go into that. Otherwise, this video would be hours and hours long. But, yeah, and that's basically it. Came home, did my videos. Um, I didn't watch any TV until really, really late. I watched Gogglebox, which I love. I love um, Mary and Giles. And I love Mary and Marina. Those are my favourites. They always make me smile. Um, I can't watch any violence. So I find Gogglebox is getting a bit scary now because they show channels, for those of you who haven't watched it, they show programmes and channels and films that happen during the week and they get people's reaction. So for some reason, everybody on Gogglebox loves Line, line of Duty and they get fascinated with Mr H. I don't get it because I don't watch it and it's a bit ominous and then yesterday they had somebody who was who was fleeing from a shark and I realized oh my god I can't watch this so I turned down the volume I've got to go because that's my phone bye